Today's World Insights. Record-setting spread of COVID-19 in global hotspots and recurring infection spikes in North and Southeast Asia. How worried should we be? And running against time. Scientists are racing to get potent treatment for COVID-19. The latest on a vaccine from David Ho, who invented the cocktail therapy, hiv AIDS. The virus doesn't recognize national borders, and I think science doesn't recognize national borders. Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. We begin today's program with the worsening coronavirus pandemic. The Chinese mainland has reported over more than 100 daily new coronavirus cases, a big surge since April. Though the number is not huge, it is still worrisome to the Chinese public. The U.S. remains the epicenter, of course, of the world, accounting for over a quarter of the world total. The second and third worst hit countries of Brazil, India. Meanwhile, in some other countries that are earlier, the pandemic was well contained. Now they are encountering a surge in infections, such as Japan and South Korea. Now, out of the woods yet, how can nations cope with this peak and valleys of recurring infections? For more, we are joined in Seoul by Dr. Alice Kim Kang Tan, who is an internist at Miz Medi Women's Hospital in Tokyo, Professor Koji Wada from Faculty of Medicine from the International University of Health and Welfare in Nashville, United States, Dr. William Schaffner, Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine and in New Haven, uh, Mr. Xi Cheng, Associate Professor for Health Policy and Economics from Yale School of Public Health. Wonderful to have four of you and to also see the four of you safe and sound amid the pandemic. Let me start by talking about the situation in China. Uh, Mr. Xi Cheng, I'm sure you've been watching it very closely for the very first time since April. The cases confirmed in China have exceeded uh, more than a hundred, though that number is very small compared to many countries, but to China is already an alert. Mr. Xi Cheng. Yeah, I think we are still in the time uh, period without uh, effective uh, antiviral drugs or vaccine. So conventional um, non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions are still very helpful. There is no need to be panic at this moment because I think with uh, the cumulative uh, experience in Wuhan, in Beijing, and now in Dalian and uh, Xinjiang with the autonomous region. I think those uh, conventional uh, health measures still are helpful, like early diagnosis, early report, early isolation, and early treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can use that e efficiently, effectively, we can still curb those uh, flare-up of the virus outbreak. But sometimes we need to be smart in uh, implementing those measures, for example, whether uh, the healthcare sector could be more effective in treating those patients and uh, giving the doctors more incentive, uh, encouraging uh, the patients or potential patients to be having an early diagnosis. That would be very helpful. Uh, right. The United States have been discussing this, like uh, how to encourage people to be tested and how to uh, reimburse the doctors for ordering the test and the contact of treatment. Okay. A spike in infections uh, hit Asia, for example, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Japan, South Korea, Australia, if you think about the Asia Pacific region, all of which uh, seem to have infections uh, reasonably under control recently. Hong Kong races against a wave of new 100 cases a day. Well, Vietnam had a nude awakening with nearly three dozen new cases. Japan had nearly a thousand on Tuesday, while South Korea posted 48 new infections. In Australia, state of Victoria, authorities announced 295 new cases on Wednesday. These are just some of the latest numbers. We have some of those coming from this part of Asia. Uh, for for example, uh, Dr. Uh, Wada coming from Japan, tell me more about how Japan is struggling with this uh, new wave uh, uh, of uh, infections. Uh, what do you think have been the characteristics of this time? 
in April, uh, we have uh, an outbreak, and uh, we have some uh, uh, cases of the COVID in Tokyo as well. And uh, the government has declared a state of emergency in April, and uh, the wave has been controlled. But since uh, early July, the gradually the number of patients are increasing, and uh, there are huge disputes between the uh, public health and the economy. And now the economy has a very strong pressure uh, for the uh, government. So the government are not able to have the uh, intense intervention for reducing the human contacts to control the number of uh, infectious uh, of the patients of the COVID-19. So we are uh, in the dilemma between the how we could control the infectious disease and also uh, maintaining the uh, economic activities. Mm -hmm. That's the situation in, in Japan. That is an ultimate question a lot of economies are facing these days. Also, Dr. Tan, in South Korea, you have waves earlier, mostly under control, and this time another slightly picking up. Are you worried what have been earlier cases help you to understand the current situation? So currently, we're seeing a shift uh, in where the clusters are occurring. Uh, our most recent big cluster was in the city of Gwangju, which is in the southwest corner of our country. It's about 1.5 million in population. And uh, I'm not sure that they were quite ready in terms of the epidemiological support that they needed up front uh, to get on top of the, the spreading cluster. And I think going forward, that's what uh, Korea and many countries need to do, is we need to have sort of a, a mobile epidemiological uh, team that can go to the rural or to the non-metropolitan areas, because clusters will emerge in those areas that perhaps were uh, quiet in the beginning stages mm -hmm. of the outbreak. Another uh, sort of a, a blind spot for us, I think, was the seaports of entry. Uh, recently, we've had large numbers of cases in, from Russian flagged ships bringing cargo into Korea, and uh, their crew members have infected uh, domestic Korean workers. And also, as they have disembarked from their ships, we've discovered that they have been carrying COVID-19 mm. into our country. So it's right now uh, our focus is on controlling what's going on in the outskirts of our country domestically, but also securing our, our borders and um, controlling the numbers of imported cases right. that have been uh, coming in. The numbers of imported cases have outnumbered the domestic cases uh, in, in the recent weeks. I see. It's mind-boggling because there are so many things that we still do not know about this virus and the reasons are contributing to the latest uh, confirmed cases. If you look at the world, so far more than 16 and a half million confirmed cases already and with more than 650,000 deaths in 216 countries or territories according to the latest from WHO. More than 4.2 million of those infections are in the United States, with now we already know the number 150,000 deaths reported. Spiking numbers did little to persuading the U.S. president, of course, uh, talking about uh, taking ultra violet light or disinfectant. Uh, Dr. Schaffner, um, how do you see the next stage from one to one million in the U.S.? it takes 100 days. From 3 million to 4 million, only 15 days. People are really worried, Dr. Schaffner. I'm sure you do too, especially. So I'm an optimist and I'm very worried because we have a serious circumstance, serious conditions in the United States, so very different than the countries of my colleagues on this program. In my country, the virus is out of control. There is no doubt that it is spreading widely over much of the United States. And uh, the control measures are not directed really from Washington. They have been left to the discretion of the various governors of the states. So we have very, very different programs in the states 
and even within states. And so this virus is really spreading widely. I'm afraid the uh, simple matter of wearing masks has become a political issue, if you can think about it. Uh, one party uh, wants nothing to do with masks. The other one is advocating masks along with our public health leaders. Mm -hmm. So we are in a very, very difficult uh, position. And frankly, I anticipate that we will have many more infections and 150,000 deaths is just profoundly sad, but we will have more, I'm afraid. Tell me, Dr. Xi Chang, about that. Um, because uh, the world is so much linked, we know virus doesn't reflect any national border. So as long as we have some of the top on the list, uh, such as Brazil, the United States, India, um, that are really having exponential growth. What does that mean for the other economies uh, in terms of opening border, in terms of uh, cooperation against the virus uh, at the time when anything related to it could become political? Uh, the transparency, uh, com communication, coordination is very important. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, if uh, in the U.S. Uh, we have no consensus, reaching consensus about how to coordinate efforts at the local level and have national strategy, uh, strategy. Then it's hard to think about how to make uh, uh, corporations and make global efforts across countries mm -hmm. with U.S. being traditionally the number one in, uh, investor in the global health. So, so far, I think in the U.S., um, the, there's a, a a huge demand in the, uh, in the coordination for all kinds of things, PPEs, and even in the best scenario, uh, when the vaccine comes in the fall or in the early next uh, year, uh, whether there should be a, uh, there could be a plan for the distribution within the country and across countries, that would be very important. And I want to emphasize the key word, coordination, because even with a national plan, how to coordinate efforts across states would mm. be very important. According to our recent uh, empirical study and our colleagues at uh, MIT, there is large spillover of those policies across borders. Mm -hmm. So we cannot uh, do nothing and in exchange for others to do this public health measures. So every party, every state, every country need to do their part in order to generate the positive spillover effect. Mm -hmm. For example, in the U.S., uh, we find if like uh, one third of the neighboring states are doing the shelter at home uh, order, then even if the home country, the home states are right. not doing this, this is equivalent to they are doing this. So we need to generate the positive spill over uh, within country and across countries. Right. It is not the first time. It is not the second time. It's not even the 99th time that during our discussions at various times, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that we talk about international cooperation and the real significance of it. It's not empty words. It's not p political rhetoric. It is real lives we're talking about, Dr. Schaffner. Now, there are things about national, so-called uh, uh, vaccine nationalism that you have seen that uh, uh, lack of uh, coordination in terms of vaccine research uh, therapeutic research uh, uh, internationally that has led to where we are. Uh, how do you see, even as uh, scientific research goes on, will it really help the people in need? Well, I certainly hope so. You know, this started out very, very well, the international cooperation, because the molecular virologists in China established what the genome of the COVID-19 virus was and then shared that information with the world, and that permitted work on therapy and on uh, vaccines to begin almost immediately. I must say that within our country, I have heard more discussion than ever before that we must pay attention to our global responsibilities, and when vaccines and therapies become available, we must share those. How that will work out, I'm not sure. But there are, there's certainly a sensibility among many people, and certainly my colleagues in public health and clinical medicine, wish to share, and equity 
not only within our country, but right. around the world, is really something that we are discussing yeah. and we hope will work out. There are quite a number of uh, vaccine candidates, of course, around the world. Uh, uh, Dr. Tan, when I was talking to the head of the Vaccine Institute, uh, which is based in Seoul, South Korea, they were telling me about all the latest development, but uh, uh, about uh, vaccine nationalism, how, do, uh, how does South Korea and a frontline doctor like you look at that issue? And how do you think really things can be resolved so that we can lay down the framework once it becomes a reality, the real vaccine, we can get it to the people in real need. I think we need to determine, you know, who are those people in real need? In other words, we have to establish a priority list in terms of who will be getting the vaccine first when it is available. I think um, going with what we normally do with seasonal influenza, a modified priority list, uh, makes sense. In other words, healthcare workers should be first in line and then the people who are at highest risk for developing um, you know, severe disease and, uh, and death, that would be the elderly people with comorbidities. Traditionally with influenza, we're also concerned about the pediatric population and pregnant women. However, uh, with COVID-19, they do not seem to be included in that high risk po population and also I'm not sure that um, we've done safety trials in that population, and so um, they may be a little bit lower on the list in terms of who receives the vaccine within our country once it becomes available. Mm. Uh, in South Korea, we have uh, phase two and three trials ongoing um, for vaccine candidates, and we're also in discussion with uh, different pharmaceutical companies for domestic production mm. of vaccines uh, once uh, we know, um, you know what works and, and what's safe. So it, we're, we're trying, it, it, the, the difficult part about COVID-19 is we are trying to develop a vaccine in parallel with the development of the disease. Yes, we do not know the full spectrum of what we're dealing with and yet we're trying to prevent this disease from happening in the future, and, and it's a very difficult situation. Uh, but in terms of priority, uh, I, I think we have a good sense of who should receive it first. Right. It, it would be the people who are most vulnerable to uh, worse out outcomes. Yes. Dr. Vada, following what uh, Dr. Tan just said, uh, uh, we are trying to do prevention, control, treatment, vaccine, all at the same time when that virus is spreading around, the disease is getting ever more complicated. So um, about opening border uh, and uh, about uh, the uh, future platforms of cooperation, there are so many different discussions. Uh, what do you think should be the most efficient concerted effort, Dr. Vada? Yes, the, you know, the Japan is a kind of island, so the many people are really uh, wanted to prevent from the, from those who are infected are going to come to Japan by airplane or by ship, so has uh, closed the border in, uh, in, the, in March and April, mm. and uh, still we are closing the border and uh, only a certain number of people can come to Japan, but uh, we also need to consider uh, how we could establish a good system for, the, uh, for allowing people, at mm. least who need to, to travel, to come to Japan, and uh, we also are still preparing for the uh, Olympics 2021 in Tokyo, so the, the government is also uh, discussing how we could set up the uh, effective and efficient system for uh, controlling the disease and also welcoming more people to Japan. Thank you so much, uh, the four of you. No matter where you are, your contribution to your countries and therefore to the global efforts against the COVID-19. Dr. Tan in South Korea, Dr. Vada in Japan, Dr. Schaffner in the United States, and also Dr. Xi Chung in the U.S. as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Be well. You're watching World Insight. Coming up on our program, running against the clock, scientists are racing to get potent treatment for COVID-19. My interview with David Ho, who invented the cocktail therapy to treat HIV-AIDS right after this break.
and we have a, a collection of antibodies that are exquisitely potent in killing this virus. Welcome back. You're watching World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. With the surge in global COVID-19 cases, people are wondering when a viable vaccine can come to our rescue and will it become a public good? There's the news coming from Professor David Ho at Columbia University claiming antibody cocktail could offer potent treatment for prevention of COVID-19. Dr. Ho is an AIDS researcher, physician and virologist. Decades ago, he invented the cocktail therapy, which saved many lives from HIV infections. Now he's leading a team looking for COVID-19 vaccine and therapeutic treatment. Let's take a listen. Dr. Ho, before we talk to you, I was talking to a group of uh, uh, medical doctors and frontline doctors from China, Japan, South Korea, and the United States. And we've been discussing about something called a vaccine nationalism. Were you encountering similar problems? How did you and your colleagues be able to resolve it? Well, the, the tension between U.S. and China right now is not helping the scientific community address the global pandemic. You know, should our antibodies prove to be effective? Uh, we have a strategy to develop them for both the developed countries and the developing countries. Mm. Uh, and, and I think many, of the, many, if not most, of the vaccine developers have the same uh, mentality. I, I think it is mostly the, the, the governments that are speaking of nationalism rather than the uh, scientists. Mm. Uh, we, we don't, you know, the, the virus doesn't recognize national borders, and I think science doesn't recognize national borders. Now, Professor Hall, uh, all over the U.S., situation not necessarily optimistic. Uh, earlier we were also discussing this, but uh, you know, you think about from one to one million, it takes a hundred days, from three million to four million, only 15 days. So what kind of situation are we really facing now, Professor? Um, I think the U.S. is in a very bad state at the moment. Uh, with, you know, in the neighborhood of 70 thousand new cases per day with about 20 states that are still uh, having rising case low. Um, it's rather unbelievable. We're, you know, seven months into the pandemic mm. and the, the richest and strongest nation is uh, saddled with, with such a sad situation. Uh, and we still find ourselves uh, short of necessary tests and other equipment. Uh, that should not be, and it is largely due to the fact that we don't have good uh, unified uh, leadership at the top of the country. Uh, and, and leaving the country to, uh, to the various governors to carry out all sorts of different policies as you said, in New York, uh, we went through a tragic period, uh, but the policies have been correct and the epidemic has been brought under uh, pretty good control. Mm -hmm. Not as good as what's going on in China, but relatively speaking, uh, the New York area is doing well. But unfortunately, many other states are experiencing 10,000 cases per day per state. Yeah. And that's that's unbelievable. Uh, that would be, you know, in China, people would be pushing the alarm button uh, long ago, but the situation goes on day after day here. Uh, and that in part is because, uh, you know, the mixed messages have been sent from the top of, top of government. Even something as simple as wearing a mask got turned into a political issue when it is strictly a public health measure that we all should be taking. So there's a lot of policies that need to be corrected rapidly. Otherwise, if the situation persists, uh, this is going to be devastating to many parts of the, the U.S. Uh, and of course, globally, we know that the virus is uh, still rising, uh, has yet to peak and it's worse than uh, ever. 
if you think about what's going on in Brazil, India, South Africa, and much of Latin America, uh, the pandemic is picking up steam. And the, certainly, uh, very soon, the Northern Hemisphere would be facing cooler weather, uh, which uh, would favor the virus uh, even more. Mm. So we, we really need uh, to be uh, very attentive, to be very vigilant, uh, and get this pandemic uh, under control quickly. Otherwise, uh, uh, carnage uh, will follow. Are you optimistic, uh, Professor Ho, as some uh, in the United States are, uh, that early next year there will be successful vaccines and everything will be fine? I think vaccines are looking good. First of all, there are many, many different strategies being pursued uh, very rapidly. The, the scale and speed are unprecedented, and that's good. And the early indications suggest that these vaccines are inducing the right type of antibodies and so far without causing too much side effects. Mm -hmm. So all of those are good. And as you know, many are already being tested in the clinic and are moving into uh, late stage studies to assess efficacy of the vaccines. Yes. So all that is good news, uh, but it's gonna take some time to enroll you know, 20,000 subjects or 30,000 subjects. Even if the vaccines prove to be protective, we don't know a lot of other things, mm -hmm. whether there will be, the, the vaccine responses will be durable and for how long, whether the vaccine responses will be uh, sufficiently robust yeah. in elderly individuals or those with underlying medical conditions and then we don't know whether there will be rare complications of the vaccines until enough people have been vaccinated mm. and follow for long enough. So there still will be many things that we need to be cautious about, even if the early trials prove to be effective. Worldwide, as we know, it's a, it's a pandemic. It's, it's not a disease within border. And also, uh, and another complicated issue inside the United States, some even talk about, you know, a class war that is going on right now with the election coming. And so how and who will get what will become even more politicized. So uh, internationally speaking, also about the United States, uh, uh, Professor Hall, how do you see that it seems to be a zigzagging road before anything efficient can happen? Yeah, I think, you know, the people who need vaccine the most are those who are going to uh, suffer from severe disease or, 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 or be killed by the infection. Yeah. And those will be older people and those with uh, chronic medical conditions. But I, earlier I said those are the very individuals who are less likely to have a, a robust immune response. Mm. So that's the dilemma. In terms of class war, uh, given the, the U.S. society, it's always the underprivileged who get left out, right? Uh, those with, with economic power are just generally going to get uh, uh, the, the good interventions uh, first. And, and in terms of the nationalism issue, I think that's going to be true because initially the supply will be short. Uh, and, and demand will be great. And so uh, it's, it's likely that uh, many nations will be left behind uh, while the, the richer nations will develop their own uh, strategies to prevent infection. So I think US, China, Europe will generally do well, uh, but there will be a whole bunch of people who will be left behind. Mm -hmm. And, and yet, you know, I could tell you the scientists uh, working uh, in this field uh, want greater equity uh, when it comes to distributing the, the products of our work. Uh, right. and, and we just need to figure out strategies to do so. Uh, unfortunately, we do have, you know, uh, foundations and other organizations uh, thinking about the developing world and how how uh, they may assist in distributing uh, effective interventions. Mm. 
I know that uh, from the Chinese government, there was already a commitment that once a successful vaccine comes into being, it will be, quote unquote, as China committed, a global public good. But uh, that commitment, how it will be implemented amid a very complex uh, geopolitics and lack of international cooperation is uh, another story. Having said that, though, I want to move to China because uh, you've been doing a lot of research over the decades with your counterparts in China, Professor Ho. You help also the growing of the younger generation of researchers in China. Uh, Professor Ho, how do you see China's approach so far? Now, China's approach is probably unique compared to the other countries because China's governance structure. But how will China still remain safe when, you know, the COVID-19 is further spreading across the world? Yeah, I think, you know, China suffered first uh, from the outbreak. Uh, but China has done a remarkable job in controlling uh, that outbreak. And, and seriously, only Wuhan and Hubei province suffered greatly. The rest of the other provinces uh, were hit, but they managed the situation rather well overall. And yes, uh, the, the Chinese governmental structure allows for more directives to be passed down and, and people are more inclined to follow. And part of the problem in the U.S. is the, you know, the public here has a, uh, a huge sense of freedom, uh, but, but often they forget that that freedom comes with a set of responsibilities. That's true. And, and, and when it comes to public health, that set of responsibility is very, very important. And so that's part of why U.S. is not doing well. And, and as I said earlier, uh, it's also due to the mixed messaging uh, from the top of the, uh, of the government. Uh, in China, uh, I think, uh, you know, still is going to experience uh, re further spread of this virus or reintroduction of the virus. And one thing uh, China needs to be mindful of is that the strain that swept through Europe and, and United States is a variant strain that is thought to be more transmissible. Mm. And if that strain, if that is indeed correct, we're not sure of that yet. If that strain were introduced into China, would it be as easy to control as the original strain from Wuhan? We don't know that yet, mm. but that's something to keep in mind. Professor David Ho talking about the general situation about COVID-19. Professor Ho is in the race together with his team against time to find a treatment and vaccine for COVID-19. He directed a team that isolated 1990 bodies from five patients who have been extremely ill with COVID-19. They found out how the antibodies neutralized the virus. Thus, they say the battle against COVID-19 could be opened on separate fronts, such as Ho has studied in HIV. During my interview with Professor Ho, he explained to me the antibodies isolated in these experiments could offer a possible solution. How? Take a listen. I want to congratulate now for the latest achievement you and your team has made about antibodies. Tell me more about that. Yes, so we reported last week in, in Nature uh, our discovery of a collection of monoclonal antibodies that are directed to COVID-19 and specifically binding to the spike on the outside of the, the virus. And we have a, a collection of antibodies that are exquisitely potent in killing this virus. And up till our work, uh, it is only known that antibodies directed to one region of the spike uh, could neutralize the virus by blocking its engagement of the cell receptor. Mm. But we also found that there are several other regions on the spike that antibodies could target and could also inactivate the virus. Mm. So how did you find all of these antibodies? How many kinds are there? Why are they relevant while others are not? What kind of process you use in order to find them? 
Well, we, we first isolated these from uh, five different infected patients. And we selected these patients because we noticed that their blood uh, contained particularly strong antibodies against COVID-19. And so we then took their uh, blood cells mm -hmm. and only isolated those cells that are responsible for making antibodies. And these are called B cells. And we also target those B cells that could recognize the spike. Mm. So then we clone those cells out and then individually sequence the antibody gene uh, to obtain these. So it's an elaborate technical effort to get to the antibodies. And overall, we from these five individuals, we obtain over 250 monoclonal antibodies and half of them turn out to be specific uh -huh. for the spike. And about a quarter of them were capable of neutralizing the virus. Mm. And of those, uh, we have uh, nine that were exquisitely potent. That is, it could kill the virus at extremely low concentrations. And those obviously are ones that we are considering to take forward as agents to treat or prevent mm -hmm. uh, COVID-19 infection. So, so from now on, uh, David, uh, what does that mean? Uh, how are you going to use the results that you have got so far for either therapeutic treatment or for vaccine possibilities? Tell me more. Uh, what are the process? Well, I think first we, we are in the process of selecting which ones are the best candidates to take forward as potential products for clinical use. Um, and then we will put those into manufacturing uh, in under conditions that are suitable for human administration. Mm. And then we hope to do that in the in, uh, upcoming few months. Uh, and then the, its utility, the utility of the antibody would be largely twofold. One is that they could be used as antibody drugs uh, particularly for individuals early in the course of their infection, mm -hmm. we could give them such antibodies and hopefully prevent the disease from progressing to uh, a severe state or, or, or resulting in death. Um, and, and obviously, we know that the severe outcome is generally seen in elderly individuals yeah. or those with underlying chronic medical conditions. So that's one application. The other one is uh, it's use it like a vaccine. And in fact, antibodies are passive vaccines. Mm -hmm. So uh, individuals who are at high risk for developing severe disease or death from COVID-19 uh, could be uh, administer such antibodies uh, and, and see if the antibodies could protect them from infection. There are different strains of uh, the virus that have led to uh, the COVID-19. Now, you talk about some of the, all the cases you use are from the United States. Uh, many suggest that the origin of the virus uh, of uh, the United States uh, so far uh, are, are from Europe. So that strain of the virus and the infection. Uh, and then there's also the issue of uh, mutation. As the virus uh, spread around, uh, there will be changes to the virus. So how will your research now uh, be relevant as uh, you know situation develops? And how will your research now in the United States be relevant to the others, uh, you know, maybe of other strains of this uh, virus? Yes, uh, that's a very important uh, point you raise. Uh, we, of course, have been looking at the antibody against not just a single strain of COVID-19, but multiple. Mm -hmm. So we have looked at strains from Wuhan, from Seattle, Washington, which was derived from Wuhan. And of course, we have uh, strains uh, in the New York City area that were uh, largely derived from Europe. Mm -hmm. And in particular, there's a strain that is, seems to be dominant in the world right now, accounting for about 70% of the new infections. And that strain we, of course, uh, uh, have examined. And the antibodies that we have developed work against the original Wuhan strain, as well as many of the circulating strains today. So uh, as of now, all of these 
uh, divergent viruses are equally susceptible to mm. the killing by these antibodies. What? And in terms of mutations, uh, obviously that's something we're, uh, we're mindful of. Uh, these RNA viruses mutate, they could mutate to escape from drugs or antibodies. Uh, and uh, this is why when the antibodies are applied clinically, mm. it's most likely going to be applied in a two antibody cocktail rather than using them as uh, single uh, entities. Yes. So uh, that will help to prevent the, the virus from escaping. Professor David Ho, who invented the cocktail therapy against HIV AIDS, now is busy with his team running against the clock on COVID-19. And that's all we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World of the Insight or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.